based on multiple studies, multiple surveys, focus groups, interviews with dozens of journalists who work in Lebanon. They are from all over the world, mainly from Lebanon and the Arab world. Uh, my research partner, Sara Malad, who is not with us uh, this year, who is actually a, a partner on this study. And this lecture is perfectly positioned after Dr. Anna's uh, lecture, so I will build up on some of the concepts that she spoke about. The focus of the lecture is the media industry. Now you will see the word journalism mostly because most of them were working in the journalism industry. And I know most of you either are journalists, want to be journalists, or are former journalists working in academia teaching journalists. This study, these studies, sorry, or this lecture could be applied to multiple other industries beyond the media scope, beyond the media industry, and could definitely be applied throughout the Arab world. In fact, what I would claim, and you could, can feel free to agree or disagree with me on that, that what I'm gonna present today is actually a best case scenario for women journalists in the Arab world. I will, I will claim that Lebanon in terms of employment, in terms of culture tends to be relatively more open than many other Arab countries. But again, you can, you can disagree with me on that. So any media academic, any journalism, professor or instructor knows that whenever they walk into class, they're going to expect more women or men? More? Somebody shout it out. More men in the classroom? Who are the academics? Raise your hand. All right, you walk into class. How many men do you, how many, who do you have more, men or women? women? Predominantly women. Across the globe, with very, very few exceptions, definitely in Lebanon and the Arab world. Roughly speaking, 75% of the students in journalism programs are women. And 25% are men. In communication, public relations, it's even higher. In broadcast journalism, it also tends to be slightly higher. But this is the rough, the average number across the board in media education. This is not just in Lebanon, the Arab world, this is across uh, the board with very, very few exceptions again. Now you would assume that these journalism students, these percentages would be reflected in the industry, right? Logic, huh? But that's not the case. The reality, at least in Lebanon, but also in many other countries. And I do build this, uh, some of these uh, generalizations uh, on a book by the International Women's Media Foundation, IWMF, that included studies from many countries around the world. But this is not the key information. The key information is that it's not just that the men are a majority, but when you go up in the corporate hierarchy, less and less women are in positions of leadership and positions of power. So in the news industry across the board, roughly one-third women, two-thirds men. You go up to about top management, news directors, CEOs, VPs, vice presidents, you will see that women make up barely 22%, and men, 78%. If you go further up to governance, the top tier of a corporation, the boards, <laughs> stock owners, you'll find the percentage is even less, 15% of women. But even that 15% is actually misleading. I'm going to give you Lebanon as a case study. I'll show you four TV stations and their main stock owners, and you'll see how many women and men are there. This is MTV, Mor TV, Carol Al Mor is the only major woman stock owner there, owns 10% of the company. Who is Carol al -Mur, for those of you who are from Lebanon? No one? You know her? She's the daughter of Gabriel Mur, the main owner, right? Remember that in a moment. Future TV, Ahiya al-Hariri and Nazik al-Hariri. Dahiya al-Hariri is the sister 
of former Prime Minister Rafil Hariri and Nazik is the wife of former Prime Minister Rafil Hariri. Each one owns 10%. Remember that too. Orange TV. Claudine Michel Aoun, Chantal Michel Aoun, Mireille Michel Aoun. Who's Michel Aoun? And the main owner of this station. LBC, Randa Saad Daher, who is the wife of Pierre Daher, she owns 1%. I'll tell you why in a moment. Rula Saad, she is Randa's sister. Kintu, Kintu is that what you say in Arabic? Rima Saad, also her sister. Iman Al Khouri, also her sister. Okay? So if you think about these four stations, what do you see? What's the trend? Can I get a couple of opinions here? What can you conclude? Let's have somebody in the back. And let me, for those of you who don't know the laws in Lebanon, in Lebanon you cannot own as an individual or as a family more than 10% of an audiovisual institution. And by family, they define it as a person and their spouse and their underage kids. Exactly. So what he's saying is that these women are there mainly because of their familial relationship. We had a hand up there here. Anything else you can conclude from that? Given that you know the 10% rule now? That's the reason why Randa Daher, the wife of Pierre Daher, has 1% and Pierre Daher has 9%. 9 plus 1 equals 10. They cannot own more as a family. Someone in the middle. Uh, I guess that um, the ownership is also misleading because there's a stronger male figure um, in this family that is actually probably more in charge of what is going on. So you can't really count those as um, equal parts. Absolutely. And in fact, it's not probably, it's, uh, it's a fact that these women are there on paper. We reviewed the meetings, the minutes of the meetings of the board. They are never there. And that main person always signs on their behalf. Okay, so they're just there for a nominal reason. And more importantly, to circumvent the 10% law. If you cannot control a media institution because you cannot, you can only have 10%, so you give it to people you can control. That way you control the institution. So women stockholders are absent from board meetings, which again helps men, the real owners of these institutions, evade the 10% ownership law. Our conclusion was that women in governance, which is only 15%, at best have nominal power. At best, they're just names on paper. At worst, they perpetuate patriarchy. They are just helping these men dominate these media institutions. We asked a sample of journalists, how many, these are all women here, how many people do you manage? Oh, sorry, how many, super, uh, how many of your supervisors uh, are men? 68% said their supervisors are men. <coughs> How many of you manage one employee? 33%. How many of you manage five employees? 15%. How many of you manage more than 25 employees? 3%. And these 3% are mainly also have familiar con connections with the owners, okay? Now, I'm not saying these managers are not competent or not good at that job, but we have to raise the question, would you have been in that management position as a woman had you not had this connection, your father, your brother, your whatever uh, family member owns that station or controls that station. Now, in a most recent study we conducted last year, we also wanted to go deeper into leadership and understand why women are not getting into leadership. There are many reasons. One of the common reasons across the world usually is perceptions of leadership. How do we perceive people in leader? What are the characteristics that we should have? So we found that men are more likely than women to believe the following, that men are more effective leaders than women, that men are more authoritative than women, 
And that authoritative term is very key because most of us actually believe in this, that manager has to be, the leader has to be authoritative. And if you believe that men are more authoritative than women, you are more likely to believe that women or men should be in positions of leadership. That women have equal opportunity to advance into leadership. And that it is easier for women to ask for promotions and pay increases. Predom not predominantly, more men than women believe that. When we asked the women, they were more likely to believe that it is easier for men to achieve all of the above. So you can see the disparity in perception. And this is very important when it comes to perception of leadership. And men's perception of leadership is more important than women's perception of leadership right now. Why? Why is that? Because they are the manager. They are the ones deciding if you're going to be a manager or not. They look at you and see somebody who is less authoritative than a man, who is less qualified to be a leader than a man. Does that make sense? You've heard of the uh, glass ceiling, right? The glass ceiling is a theoretical conception that there's an invisible barrier for women to cross when it comes to the corporate hierarchy. The global glass ceiling is somewhere in news and journalism at the senior management level. Somewhere around, a little bit under CEO and president, right around pre a, a news director. In Lebanon, based on our data, it's at the senior professional level. There's a lot of newscast producers. There's a lot of news editors. But not a lot of presidents, not a lot of news directors. We also found that there's a lot of gendered practices. Practices that discriminate based on gender. 38% of women we surveyed have experienced at least one of the following. She was told she cannot cover a story because she's a woman. She was reassigned to a different task or story because she was a woman. A junior employee refused to take directions from her because she was a woman. A co-worker ignored her opinion or request because she was a woman. A, super, a superior ignored her opinion or request. She was declined a promotion or a co-worker refused to work with her because she was a woman. And I know I see a lot of nodding heads among the women in the group and I know you've at least experienced one of these things at one point in your life, but that's unfortunately too common in this part of the world. Even some of the top journalists I've worked with, some of the most, most authoritative Arab journalists I've worked with, have had to tackle, yell at, scream at camera persons because this camera person just wants to do whatever he wants and does not want to take orders from a woman. Going to the hot, back to the hot topic that Dr. Anna was talking about, and we'll spend a little bit extra time on this um, because I think it's a bigger problem than we think. Two out of three women journalists that we surveyed experienced at least one form of sexual harassment at least once in their career. Two out of three. So let's give a definition since we were discussing earlier what the common definition of sexual harassment is. A behavior characterized by making an of unwelcome and inappropriate sexual remarks or physical advances in a workplace or other professional or social situation. Okay? Now there is tons and tons of literature on sexual harassment. We're not going to go into that. Uh, you, Dr. Anna spoke about the, uh, the Me Too movement and how it's changing things, give or take, some with some success and some failures. What we did in our study we used a typical definition of sexual harassment and the five types of sexual harassment. And I'll explain what they are. Actually, we only used four of the five. I'll explain what the fifth one are. But I do invite you to write down this hashtag, that's harassment. Put it on YouTube, put it on any browser, and you'll find tons and tons of videos and examples of real cases of harassment reenacted by professional actors. This came out of the Me Too uh, movement, too. I'll show you the website very quickly. 
Um, you can see, for example, with a doctor, at work, uh, with a boss, uh, with a photographer, dozens of these videos. Please watch them. They're very educating. And some of them actually help you know how to deal with it. Because if I know one thing about the daunting issue of sexual harassment, it's not about its prevalence, it's about the difficulty to deal with it. Many men don't experience it. Dr. Claudia said some men do, and that is true, but predominantly women, women are the victims of sexual harassment. And we do not train, neither journalists nor women in general, to deal with that. It is one of the most difficult things to deal with. You would think, oh, it's easy, just tell him to uh, F off or go away. Well, try to think of that person as holding your own career, your own life, your own future, and things start changing. But I don't want to go into more details of that. That can go back to our study. We actually asked about the four types of sexual harassment. There's one missing here we didn't ask about uh, due to methodological reasons. Verbal sexual harassment. Words, terms, tultish in Arabic. Nonverbal sexual harassment, winks, any kind of signal that is not verbal. Physical sexual harassment, touching, cornering, or unwelcome touching and cornering, and threatening sexual harassment, the worst kind, the quid pro quo sexual harassment, where I will give you this if you give me that. I will give you a job if you give me that. I will give you a promotion if you give me that. I will let you cover the story if you give me that. I will give you that role if you give me that. You all know what that is. 58% of our sample have experienced uh, verbal sexual harassment. 48% experienced nonverbal sexual harassment. 30% experienced physical sexual harassment. And 12% experienced quid pro quo threatening sexual harassment. And these data, the last one, is one of the most important and one of the most underreported because many people experience that, many women experience that at entry level, at entry into a job. So you can imagine how many women actually left that job or didn't even enter into that job because they refused such sexual harassment. One out of 10 women we interviewed, 10 women journalists said they considered leaving their jobs due to sexual harassment. One out of 10, about 10%. Just imagine how many already left their job and were not in our sample. And you can figure out how these data are actually underreported. In fact, in Lebanon, we do not have any laws against sexual harassment. We're trying to pass some. And thanks for the predominantly men parliament members, the, la the latest bill that we tried to pass was mocked and joked about, and men in parliament became defensive about it, and it didn't pass. And now they're trying to pass another more watered down version. More importantly, media companies, syndicates, do not have any policies against that. They'll tell you, oh, it's human rights. We don't need to put a policy in that. We have something ridiculous called khach al I don't know what that means, and its interpretation is so vague. Unless somebody gets raped, there's no legal text to protect them. 75% of women journalists said their companies have no policies against sexual harassment. The 25, guess which companies those are? They're the international, international companies that are required by law by their own countries, you know, the BBC's, Bureau, the CNN's, by their own countries to have these policies. We also conducted some interviews. And here's some of the quotes that we received. It's endemic, it's systemic, it's everywhere. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not harassed. I can't emphasize how many times I've been harassed by public officials, police, security, and armed forces. But who am I supposed to report it to? Those supposed to protect you are the ones who engage in it. They either ignore you, or worse, 
Some of you know what she's going to say, right? They say you must have invited it upon yourself. Blaming the victim is pretty common in sexual harassment and in rape. Studies across the globe report that sexual harassment is almost always underreported. More important for us as media liter literacy practitioners, academics, and journalists, media also underreport and have historically underreported sexual harassment, especially in this part of the world. Now, the Me Too movement has slightly changed that, but not to a lot of success across the globe, not in, in this part of the world. And for some reason that I do not understand, whether it's in Lebanon or in Jordan or in Iraq or in Egypt, we somehow become so defensive when we say sexual harassment is so prevalent in our societies. And we say, oh, there's no data. The data is exaggerated. In fact, every single study actually shows that the data are underreported. Women don't want to report that they've been sexual harassment because we blame them when they say they're sexu they're, they're, uh, they've been sexual harassed, sexually harassed. It's a stigma. But think about that. Most researchers that were working with us reported that interviewees did not seem to be aware of what sexual harassment is. Those are women journalists who are supposed to be telling society what sexual harassment is. A lot of the comments are, oh, that's sexual harassment. OK, now I know. If you want to compare sexual harassment coverage in the media, compare it to how many times we cover journalists who have been attacked because of a non-sexual nature. 9% of women journalists experience, the ones in our uh, survey, experience physical assault of a non-sexual nature at least once in their career. But whenever a journalist is assaulted physically, they are immediately reported, right? But sexual harassment is often hidden. To also show that uh, sexual harassment is underreported, ask the sample that you're studying, do you think it's important to have laws and policies against sexual harassment? And you will see the answers. In some of our studies, it hit 99% and 98%. Sexual harassment is a problem for female journalists in Lebanon, 87% agreed. It is important for companies to have policies for sexual harassment, 95% agreed. It is important for the Lebanese penal code to have specific references to sexual harassment, 99% agreed. In our latest study, which I didn't include the data for this, it's both men and women who actually agree on this. We also asked them if gender discrimination is a problem. 73% agreed. Is it important to have company policies on that? 98% agreed. It is important to have penal code laws on that? 97% agreed. Now I'm going to move on from this topic to something that is even actually we're discovering equally important to the problem of sexual harassment and gender discrimination. And the term that we use, that we're being, we've been using, is domestic tethers. We talk a lot about the workplace. We talk a lot about the gendered workplace, the hostility in the workplace, the difficulty in the workplace. But we rarely study the pressures that women face at home. Worldwide, women continue to shoulder the majority of unpaid domestic work. I'm sure many of you agree on that. Even the most enlightened men in our society would agree on that. And unfortunately, in our societies, we are raised as men to look down on something like this. Well, I'm a man. I don't do these things. I don't take care of the kids or clean the house. That's a woman's job. The Middle East having the highest gender disparity. Study after study shows when there are two people working in the house, I'm talking about a typical family in the Arab world, when women's and men's home responsibilities compete with their work responsibilities, who sacrifices? The men? It's the women. Pretty much always the woman. Pretty much always the woman. And really, I consider myself a feminist and an advocate of feminism. And it took me a long time to realize that.
because we are not raised, we are not trained to think about these things. The other thing that we discovered is that the majority of journalists, women journalists in the workplace, are young, are not married, do not have children, although they actually have higher education than most men in the industry. Does that tell you something? It tells you that there is some reason that is, bl that is blocking them out and actually pushing them out of the industry very early in their career. Most female women journalists were not married, had no children, and were under 30. I know that journalism as a, as a job, is, it, it burns you. And most people end up leaving somewhere between 30 and, and uh, 40 years old. Many go into academia or go into a, P a PR or another career. But it affects women more than men. 93% of the women we interviewed and 45% of uh, them, sorry, 93% had BAs and 45% had MAs. In a, a more recent study, it shows more than 20% of women have graduate degrees and more than 20% of men also, of women also have more BA degrees than women, than men, sorry. We also found that 67% have worked for less than 10 years in the news industry. And they get a BA, they work for 10 years and they either get burnt out, or in most cases what happens, they get married, have children, and they drop out. After I had a child, this is a quote from one of the journalists we interviewed, I asked for a desk job. Later they decided my salary was too high. She was laid off and she switched to part-time work right after that. This is probably the story of 70 to 80 percent of women who decide to have families, specifically in journalism. It's called the mommy track. The mommy track where we advocate, yes, women need to go into the industry. Women, there needs to be equality in, uh, in, in, in job and in work and in employment. But then we forget that women are also shouldering the house, the domestic work, hence domestic tethers. And the men do not pitch in for the domestic work. So the women are doing a double shift. One of them is paid and one of them is unpaid. Many more women than men quit or reduce their job commitments when they get married and have children. That's the definition of the mommy track. There is not enough data. None of our studies were able to actually establish that. The latest, the latest work showed that actually both men and women equally drop out um, or reduce their work. And our assumption is that there's more people who are not sampled, who are not interviewed, who have already quit their work. So if anyone is interested in this line of research, this is a great place to start. And please do share the study, your study with me. We also asked them about child care assistance, paternity leave, and maternity leave. 85% of people of the uh, journalists we interviewed said their companies have no child care assistance. This is huge in this situation. If you have child care assistance, because it will alleviate some of the pressures of domestic work. Of course, 94% had no paternity leave. And interestingly, 31%, one third of the women journalists we interviewed said there's no maternity leave. Although Lebanon requires by law maternity leave. And in the latest study, the number actually of men and women who said that was over 50%, 55.4%. So how does that work? Are the companies doing something illegal? Why are they not being caught? because there's a way to do it. And here's what one of the journalists explained to us. After six years, I work 45 hours per week, yet I'm considered a freelancer. As long as you're not labeled a full-time worker, that's fine. You can work a million hours a week, who cares? We just don't want to give you any benefits. Without a con contract and without benefits. When we asked her, why didn't you quit? Why didn't you report them? She said, despite knowing that, the company is not complying with labor laws, it's better than unemployment. Yeah, the boss will come and tell you, you want to go sue me, go. Nobody's going to enforce that stupid law in Lebanon. And you're going to end up without a job. There's a million people waiting in line for a job, unfortunately. Now, we also went into very sensitive questions. 
in the latest survey of both men and women journalists. We asked them, who is primarily in charge of domestic duties? Who is primarily in char charge of childcare? Who is primarily in charge of house? Or of the house, like cleaning the house, taking care of it, and all these things. One man out of the sample of about 150 men said, I am primarily responsible for childcare. One man. Zero men said, I am primarily responsible for domestic duties. Let me repeat that. One man said, I am primarily responsible for childcare. Zero men in our sample said they are responsible for domestic duties. Zero women said, my spouse, sorry, that's a typo, not spouses. My spouse is primarily responsible for both. Not a single woman. We also found that 9% of men and 31% of women outsource household duties. They bring in domestic workers to take care of it, which is pretty common in Lebanon. But actually, it's not as common among journalists as other professions because journalism doesn't pay that much in Lebanon unless you are at the managerial position and up. So most women, that was our conclusion, rely on themselves or outside help for housework. But more importantly, Almost all men delegate this work and the organization of outsourcing it to their spouses. That's another thing that I actually learned recently. As a feminist and enlightened man, as I consider myself, I consider myself actually balancing work between me and my wife. However, she would always take care of the planning. Okay, today you need to do this, this, and that. And I've never thought, okay, that takes a lot of effort to organize these things. That work is called mental clutter. If you are the one in charge of making sure the kids' medical shots are taken, the tuition is paid, all of these things, or even just organizing it and delegating it, that is a lot of work. And that mental clutter pushes out space from your profession and from your personal life. Now moving to the pay gap. Now we've heard about the pay gap and that it is global, but we didn't have numbers in Lebanon, at least not for the journalism industry. We discovered the following. Journalists in middle income range are two times as likely to be men. Journalists in the highest income range are four times as likely to be men and those in the low income range are most likely to be women. We also accounted when we did this, these statistics for age, for seniority, for education, for experience, and the number of employees you manage. So this is not just average across the board. Regardless of your education, regardless of your seniority, regardless of everything listed here, men are still getting paid more than women. Most men and women journalists also believe that they actually have achieved pay parity, which is a dangerous belief. Because if you believe that it's fair, why would you fight for fairness? Why would you fight for eliminating the pay, pay gap? Why would you fight for the gendered environment? Fight against the gendered environment. In addition to all of that, and we are talking back here to the domestic feathers, Mothers actually get penalized immensely, while fathers get something we call a daddy bonus or a fatherhood bonus. And we were able to establish that in our data. Having children, we found, was detrimental, had a det detrimental effect on women's careers and significantly contributed to the pay gap. So journalists in the middle income range were one-third less likely than those in the low-income range to be women with children. Let me repeat that. Women in the middle-income range were one-third less likely than those in the low-income range to be women with children. And here's the most shocking data that we found. Journalists in the high-income range are 13 times more likely than those in the low-income range to be men with children. That's 
the daddy bonus mommy penalty. So all of this is a complex problem. We have gender discrimination, we have sexual harassment, we have sexism, we have nepotism, we have confessionalism, sectarianism in this country, above all this, we have patriarchy. We have no laws, a legally disenabling environment, and we have a gender divide in perception, especially of managers and leaders. All of this, in addition to the domestic tethers, that we actually need to do a lot more research on and focus the problem on, offers us this conclusion. A lot of women journalism students either don't make it into the industry or make it and then they are pushed out or blocked from going into higher and stronger positions. And this is a huge problem and it has a lot of implications because people in management in news management specifically set the agenda. They tell us what we want, what we hear, and what we see, the topics that we tackle. And if these topics are all about men and concerns of men and stereotypical views of women or how many men see women, then this is just recreating society. These are the implications. The news agenda and policy setting is set by men. Portrayal and appearance of women in the news is set by men. Inclusion and framing of issues related to women in the news is set by men. Representation of women in the news, meaning we don't have so many women leaders, women idols, women examples for girls and journal female journalism students to abide by and to strive to become like them. And then we have challenging gendered practices. This is a vicious cycle. We are trying to work on it. And this is, I think, one of the missions of media literacy, since we are so connected to journalism. And since this is a very important oppressed community, if we can fix this problem, I think we can affect all of society. I want to leave you with a couple more things. First. I don't want to give the impression that women are weak, that women are helpless. This is a quote from one of the journalists that we interviewed, and she said the following. She was a news director. You've got to be tough. You've developed thick skin. Understand that in principle, women have the same rights and expectations as men. But in reality, you'll have to work twice as hard and make sacrifices in other parts of your life to get ahead. Yes, things have changed a lot and are continuing to change, but news is still a man's world. Now, we don't have to deal with this. We don't have to deal with this. And I want to end with these last three things. You've heard the word feminism. I'm not going to go into the theory of feminism. But the conception is that, oh, feminism is just for women. No, it's not. Concepts of fem feminism, concepts of equality, concepts of fighting gender-based discrimination. Yes, it does help an oppressed group in our society and balance the field against an oppressor, a historic oppressor, but it serves men equally as women. It serves the whole society. I cannot tell you how many men journalists we interviewed were, some of them in tears, answering us in tears, how their kids grew up and they never saw them. They never experienced fatherhood. They never had the time. Yes, and they appreciate that their wife dealt with that, but they lost a huge part of this life experience because they were focused mainly on their careers and they delegated everything else to their wife. And you, I don't need to tell you how much important this, this is also for children. And one more thing, actually two more things. Sexism is not only by men. Women can also be sexist, and women can also be self-discriminating. So this idea is that if we hear a woman saying, oh, that's okay, no, it's not okay. Whether it's a man or a woman saying that, or anything in between. And one last thing, that equality in the workplace cannot really happen on its own in a vacuum without us tackling the issue of equality at home. And I will end you with this. 
and we can have some questions and some discussion. How much time do we have? Good. Great. Question. شوي لبداية المحاضرة لفت انتباهي لما نحكي 75% من طلاب الجامعة من البناء وبنيجي على أول إحصائية 67% ذكور هل نقدر نقول إنه كل المؤسسات الإعلامية ما بتوظف من طلاب الإعلام من مهن أخرى إنه من وين من وين سوق العمل راح يستحمل كل النسبة هاي إذا مش جاي أساسا من الجامعات؟ ما بعرف إذا وصلت لي. ما أنا بلا وصلت وصلت. More more and more companies are definitely hiring from the journalism discipline because it is needed. Because journal especially students coming out of good journalism programs, there are so many skills, so much knowledge now. In the past. 20, 30 years ago, most of the journalists were hired from political science and whatever other fields, right? But that's not the, that, that statistic does not show that they're not hiring from journalism. They are hiring more men than they are hiring women. Look, what, one of the participants, and I didn't include this in this study, told us literally, this is what her, the person who is employing her told her. No, Every month you're going to have your period and you're not going to be able to go and cover, cover the story. This is literally what a boss told a person, right? We don't have, unfortunately, gender discrimination laws to kick that person out of their job and put somebody more qualified and more egalitarian. I cannot tell you how many times women face this. So all this data that I'm showing you, why there are more men than women, it starts at the entry. Either there's discrimination from the start, or there's quid pro quo sexual harassment, and the person refuses and leaves, or the person goes in, experiences both sexual harassment and gender discrimination and burnout and domestic pressures, and leaves, or the toughest, toughest people remain and are blocked from going up because of that glass ceiling. Okay, hence the title, uh, what was it? Block or end? Block, push, and keep down. Right? Did I answer your? Okay. Any other question? Further. معلش دكتور إحنا بالمجتمع الشرقي كأنه يعني المقولة التي تقول ابنك على ما ربتي وجوزك على ما عودتي. يعني إذا تم توزيع الأعمال بين الرجل والمرأة في نفس البيت حتى لازم الأطفال إنهم يتعودوا مثلا إنه يساعد في ترتيب البيت أو إني إني أوزع الأدوار حتى إنه نقلل الجهد صراحة يعني من خلال تجربتي بالمدارس أحيانا يأتي الرجل ما بيعرف بنته بأي صف يعني مثلا تحكي تاسع عاشر أول ثانوي ما بعرف الشعبة إلا نرجع للقاعدة البيانات حتى نطلع إنه بنته بأي صف وكذا حتى أحيانا ما بعرف إذا بنته كانت غايبة أو حاضرة فكل هاي الأمور هي اللي بتأرق طبعا المرأة وبتصير يعني من خلال نظرتي كمعلمة أنا وكمديرة من خلال نظرتي حتى للمعلمات إنه بتكون بين بين مجالين بتكون معي ومش معي يعني عقلها بيكون مشتت بين الأطفال بدي أروح أجيب ابني الروضة سكرت كذا صار العمل مع شيء اسمه الاستقرار الغير نفسي للمعلم. I agree 100%. Worth it. Me even me. Um, as a society, and, and by the way, this is not Eastern society. This is across the world. Okay, it is changing in some societies faster than other. But yes, men are, actually there's a stigma for men taking over the, the household and dealing with children. I have many friends, they are the main child bearer, they are the main person who are dealing with the kids and the, and the household. Uh, very few of them, very, none of them actually are in this society. In fact, in this society, I have friends who would refuse their wives to work 
I have friends who would refuse their wives to actually make higher income or be more successful than they are because they have, I don't know what the term is, adatnas, stigma that they will be seen by society as weak or less successful or failures, which is ridiculous. But yes, this is the culture that we unfortunately live in and this is the culture that we have to change. And if we want to change it, one way to do it or the most effective way to do it is through media and through having role models in the media and through becoming, having women occupy powerful positions, having feminists, men and women occupy these powerful positions. Other questions? Uh, Hanadi had something in the back. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know more why everyday citizen, the guy who's walking down the streets, wants more female journalists in the newsroom. Why a media literate person wants to know that there are more and more women in top management. It's like why it's important for them to know that. Why is it important for who to Everyday know? Everyday citizen. The guy who's walking the street knows that if the woman, uh, there is less female journalist in the newsroom, that's something alarming. So why? From your uh, point of view. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, just as I said uh, earlier, the media content is not randomly decided, right? We know there are editors, we know there are gatekeepers, we know there's a hierarchy. We know there are people who set the agenda. We know there are people who censor and self-censor, right? If the most powerful people in these cultural production institutions are men, and men with specific views on society and very gendered views on society, this society is just going to recreate itself. And women's voices, women's needs, women's causes, women's issues are not going to make it. And I mean, Again, I really advise you to go and watch these videos that go back to sexual harassment and see how even a, a, a man photographer and the way they photograph a woman model, how it sexualizes and infantilizes that woman. We, I'm not saying we shouldn't have men. Ideally, we would have gender discrimination uh, and sexism eliminated, right? But we have to have diversity. And in every study in the world, whether it's race or religion or whatever, diversity always trumps non-diversity, right? It's always better for society. There's more voices in everything we do. I mean, as academics, when we are hiring, I was discussing that with uh, my colleague earlier. When we have a committee of three people who are not like-minded, different genders, different backgrounds, even in diff different theoretical perceptions, different politics, we always get a strong person, a stronger person hired. Because they all fight for the best as they see it. But if we have one, one type, one individual, then we don't always succeed in that. I don't know, I, I veered off the topic, but I hope I got, got, your, got the answer. Go ahead. Uh, نيوز اوتلت ولا مجلات نساء عشان كمان حابه اعرف من هون هدول بالمناصب الاداريه العليا من النساء باي نوع من الصحافه او او المنتج الصحفي لهم. Sure. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking up a folder here very quickly just to show you. Um, so there are multiple studies that we can talk Actually, the lecture was not based on one study, on several studies. The earlier uh, survey was only of women, of the top 250. All the surveys come from all media operations, TV, radio, newspaper, online, okay? Uh, local, regional, and international. Local Arab media and international that are operating in, in Lebanon. The second one, the only difference that included also men, okay? Uh, there are also focus groups. There are uh, in-depth interviews with a smaller uh, sample. If you want to read the detailed article, now there's one in Arabic that is published in this uh, journal. It's called, uh, I forgot the name of the, uh, the journal. There's a study in IMCR, but the one that I mainly would advise you to uh, read is this one. In journalism studies, it's called block her entry, keep her down, and push her out. And there's another study coming out in the same journal. Just give it a few months. There's also a chapter in a book. Um, 
think it's called Media Power and Journalism. Um, uh, just Google my name and Sa uh, Sarah Malat and you will find that chapter. That's based on the latest uh, data, okay? But we tried as much as possible to have a diverse sample and a random sample. We have a long list of, Lebanese, of uh, journalists working in Lebanon, both men and women now, and we randomized them. أنا بدي أعلق على مسألة ضعف تمثيل النساء كصحفيات، هلا الدراسة عرضت مجموعة أسباب اللي هي مثل المسؤوليات الأسرية، ضعف يعني توظيف النساء، وكمان في مسألة التحرش الجنسي، بس احنا مثلا بالحالة الأردنية ممكن يكون في سبب آخر لضعف تمثيل الصحفيات اللي هو إنه من نفسها الصحفية ممكن تنسحب لأنه مثلا في مجتمع ثقافته محافظة ما بتكون في حرية الحركة للصحفية يعني مهنة الصحافة يعني بتطلب إنه تتنقل كثير تتعامل مع مختلف الفئات في مجتمع محافظ هي ما عندها هاي المساحة أو هامش الحرية الكافية إنها تتنقل بنفس المرونة والحرية اللي بتمتع فيها الصحف الرجع فهذا كثير بصعب إنها تشتغل بشكل حرفي يعني إحنا عنا بالأردن حوالي 300 وسيلة إعلام نسبة الصحفيين الصحفيات هي 21 بالمية واللي بيعرف المشهد الصحفي الأردني بيعرف إنه لو كانت أساساً في حرفية حقيقية في المحتوى الإعلامي رح تكون نسبة الصحفيات لسه أقل يعني إذا كانوا بيشتغلوا فعلاً بشكل حرفي حقيقي رح يكون لسه تمثيل الصحفيات أقل أنا مثلاً من تجربتي الشخصية كثير في قصص لما كنت بروح أغطيها ميداني كنت بضطر أخذ معي زميل ذكر حتى إني يعني أقدر إني بدون داعي بس حتى إني يكون زي جواز مرور وإني أقدر أكون مرتاحة مثلا في إجراء المقابلات فهذا مثلا ممكن يكون واحد من العوامل 100% I agree with you actually this is exactly what I said at the beginning of the lecture and you may agree or disagree with me but I think this data is a best case scenario for the Arab world I do consider Lebanon to a large extent it, is, it has been for a long time accepted that women play many professional roles in this country. I'm not saying that Lebanon is uh, compared compa globally, we're, we're, we're a disaster. And there are on certain indicators, in certain professions, there are Arab countries that are better than us. But when it comes to journalism, I think Lebanon actually offers the best case scenario. Yes, definitely, I agree. That Mujtama Muhafil, you are talking about, conservative society, that is actually called a sexist society. Okay, so we just need to na name it exactly what it is. When men are allowed to go out and cover and go around and nobody says anything to them and women do, that's not a mujtama muhafid. Hey, a mujtama, what's sexist, jinsani, right? You may use being a rajul or mother. That's a mujtama muhafid. Mujtama bihafid ala al-qiyam wal akhla wal iman. أي قيم وأي أخلاق وأي إيمان بتقول إنه لازم نتحشر نتحرش بالمرأة أو لازم نمنع المرأة أو لازم نحبط المرأة هذا مش مجتمع محافظ هذا مجتمع سكسس. Okay. طيب تفضل. Uh, one more thing just before. I, I encourage you to also read this. Shape shifting in the conflict zone. This was this was based on interviews with women jur war journalists. So the most difficult type of journalism and the most gendered type of journalism and what they faced. It shows you all the difficulties that women face and how uh, they, what strategies they use to go around. And one of them, by the way, is to have a male camera person with them, okay? Sometimes to protect them, and you will find out, sometimes for them to protect the, the, the person. Because it's less likely in our mujtama muhafiz for a violent person to attack a woman, right, than to attack a, a man. So, they kind of create some kind of a symbiotic relationship there. Fadal, my. أنا بعد هذا المقال أجعل بالي سؤال ثاني. فضل. سؤالين الأول لست دلال بما إنها صحفية وأم تمام كيف أدارت حياتها بوجود العائلة كصحفية في الأردن. السؤال الثاني على موضوع الصحفية التي تغطي الحروب. إذا الرجل مدرك إنه زوجته يعني هي اللي حتنقذ الأسرة كيف بده يبعثها على مكان ممكن ما ترجع منه؟ هذا السؤال لك دكتور جاد يعني هو عارف إنها هي يعني 
إذا مات هو حيموت مطمن لأنه في إنسان راقيح يقدر ينقذ الأسرة من من بعده، فكيف بده يضحي في زوجته ويوديها على حرب وهو يعني مش مطمن عليها؟ خليني I will start with the last question. I would ask the same question otherwise. I mean, if uh, my wife is an emergency medicine doctor, right? And, uh, and I was a war journalist at one point. When the 2006 war broke out, we were actually arguing and fighting who's going to go and do, uh, do their work, right? Uh, I was terrified for her, she was terrified for me. Yeah, I would go crazy if she dies, and she, I know, would go, I don't know if she would go crazy if I died. But, uh, you'll have to ask her. But it is, it is equally problematic. Being hurt in war is equally prob problematic. Um, but why should we always think, oh, you're at risk? Not, not only war, like, don't go out at night. Like, don't go out and cover this story. But then when you don't go out and cover these important stories, these risky stories, what's happening? Somebody else is being promoted. The man is being promoted and goes up in their career, and the woman is not. So this is also a problem with our sexist mentality. I didn't talk about a concept of rape culture, which I usually give a full uh, lecture on. But our perception that women are definitely going to get raped if they are individually somewhere is a huge problem on a, on a global scale. And this also limits women's movement. I will leave the uh, space for our colleague to answer. I would love to also actually hear that answer. How do you balance, who, who did you ask? <laughs> Ella. All right. Um, and and Smail, I would encourage you to look up a uh, war correspondent. Her name is uh, uh, Ali Ibrahim, who worked with the Al Arabiya. And another one, uh, I'll give you a few names, and they will explain to you well, what they have. Uh, Alia, I think her husband is a banker, and she would tell, she was in Syria with uh, covering all kinds of crazy stuff over there. I mean, she has 20 million times more experience that I've ever imagined to have in my, my life with herself, so many times at, at risk. She has kids. Uh, she actually was covering uh, Palestinian camps when there were battles going on when she was pregnant. So you can, you can talk to her and tell her about that. يعني هلا انا صار لي بشتغل صحافي 11 سنه تقريبا كل يعني نوع الصحافه اللي بشتغلها مش اخبار انا بعتقد يمكن العيب الاساسي رح يكون اذا كنت بشتغل اخبار وكنت بحاجه اني اتواجد بشكل يومي بالمكتب واني اطلع بشكل دائم اغطي ميداني بس انا نوع الصحافه اللي بشتغلها هي نوع التقارير المعمقه والصحافه الاستقصائيه بتعتمد بشكل اساسي على البحث فيها جزء ميداني بس في جزء هذا الجزء الميداني ممكن انا انظمه بشكل ذاتي فهذا كان يساعدني في اني اقسم يعني اني احمل المسؤوليتين مع بعض، هلا بس اولادي كبروا يعني هلا انا عندي ولد عمره 21 سنه والثاني عمره 18 ونص، فلما اولادي كبروا صاروا في مرحله المراهقه وصار في عندهم امكانيه انهم يعتمدوا على نفسهم، صار عندي مساحه اوسع اني اطلع بشكل ميداني اكبر، واخر يمكن ثلاث اربع سنوات هي اكثر فتره اشتغلت فيها يعني ميداني بشكل كبير جدا. فهذا يمكن اللي ساعدني اشتغل بهي الطريقه. Any, anyone else would like to share their story? Any other woman who is a, a working journalist and has children would like to share? Without exposing your husbands, I, I know it's, we won't, we won't blame them that much. No women are willing to share? Huh? Okay, but do you want to share your experience? I'm a single mom. Okay. واللي ام دائما بتحس بتانيب الضمير لانه عليها مسؤوليات و... وانه اذا بتعدت عن اطفالها لوقت طويل بتحس انه هي ام فاشله اللي صار انه نفس ما عملت دلال تحكمت بوقتي في اوقات معينه طبعا لازم يكون في مجموعه تدعمك اللي اللي كان المفروض كمان الاكس تبعي كان جدا داعم فكان لما يكون علي شغل برا سفر بياخذ البنت بيساعدني فيها وحتى يعني قبل الانفصال هو شخص منيح يعني كان كان البارتنر تبعي فاحنا كنا بنقسم الواجبات فيعني هو الدور الذكر لساته حتى لو صار انفصال لازم يلعبه لازم يعطي مسؤوليه تجاه اطفاله مساويه لإلي حتى لو كان لعبه كبير علي برضه يعني لازم يعطيني هاي المساحه انه هو الشخص الداعم لإلي فهي بتصفي انه كيف تخلقي العلاقه مع البارتنر تبعك شو المسؤوليات وكيف نقسمها 
وبتقدر تستمر حتى لو صار انفصال. Thank you and thanks for sharing the issue of uh, feeling guilty. There's a lot of research uh, on that and it's not it's it's not inherent in the woman to feel guilty because they are women but it is because society makes them feel guilty compared to men. If a woman comes to work and her kids are sick, oh, what a bad mother, right? If a man, ah, oh, great, we don't even care. We don't even mention it. I, I can tell you how many, I can tell you so many examples um, of this sexist treatment that actually is so much to our advantage as men. Like I can give you small things. Like when I, when I travel, and sometimes I take my, my kids are now grown up, uh, but when, I, when they were babies, when I would be in the plane carrying them and I'm on my, my own, I can't tell you how many flight attendants and how many people come and volunteer to take the kids and help me. My wife never experiences that. <laughs> She's always pissed off at that. <laughs> Other question? Uh, somebody in here. Um, هو سؤال لحضرتك من متابعتك. أكاديمية. هل بتشعر أحيانا أن التغطيات الصحفية للمواضيع ذات العلاقة بالمرأة أنه عادة بتم انتزاعها من سياقها الاقتصادي والاجتماعي يعني في كثير أمور عشان نفهمها عشان نفهم ليه وصلت لهون في في تاريخ وراها وجزء من حل الموضوع أنه نفهم الخلفية التاريخية أنا على المستوى الشخصي عفوا بشعر أنه يعني عم بتم طرح الموضوع بطريقة شوي عدائية أحيانا ممكن تكون شوي ممكن تخلق بيئة سلبية تجاه مناقشة الموضوع نفسه يعني يعني مثلا معظم النقاشات اللي صارت هلا كانت كثير هاديه وكانت كثير واضحه لانه حضرتك بسطت لنا الموضوع بافضل طريقه ممكنه وحطيت لنا الموضوع سياق من خلاله واحنا ناقشناه، لكن بالصحافه ما بصير هذا الشيء او من يعني هيك عم بشرح على الاقل. واي واي كمل كمل ليه ما بتصيرش عم لانه الخطاب شو شو النتيجه السلبيه وعلى مين؟ يعني احيانا بيكون على المطالبين بالموضوع نفسه واحيانا على المراه نفسها. اعطيني مثلا اعطيك مثال انه مثلا مثلا في كثير مجتمعات بالاردن مثلا انه هي الفقر هي الـ 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 السائد فيها فانه عاده معظم مؤسسات المجتمع المدني بتروح تتوجه للنساء لتمكين النساء مع انه في نفس البيت نفسه في رجل عم بيعاني من نفس الاوضاع الاقتصاديه الصعبه وعنده كثير تحديات هائله يعني مش عم بتبرر عنفه لكن هو عم بواجه تحديات بنفس الوقت وبيتم تجاهله ف في بعتبر على المستوى الشخصي بحس انه بشعر انه في سوء لتصميم المشاريع المتخصصه بهذا الموضوع وبنفس الوقت بنفس الوقت سوء بالخطاب نفسه او عدم وعي بالخطاب نفسه. Um, look, I, I may agree or disagree with on certain things you've said. Um, yes, uh, uh, in the end, oppression is oppression, whether it's on men, women, children, anything, right? But this does not mean that highlighting a historically oppressed community, woman, will actually take away from other oppressions in society. Um, we are talking about roughly 50% of society here. And when it comes to, if we just say women in general, we're saying 50%, but then if you think about it further, women of color, women of specific uh, religions or minorities, women who are lower than middle class, middle, middle income, um, specific groups of, of women are even more and more oppressed. Are we dealing with this in the most effective way? I don't know. Yani the answer is going to be with the outcome. Have we been able to advance women's rights to reduce gender-based oppression in society? I think in Lebanon, on the legal level, at least we have, okay? Uh, thanks to the women's movement in Lebanon, there have been several laws that have been passed that further protect women. Are we there yet? No. Okay. I don't know about, you're from Jordan, I'm guessing. I don't know about the case, the details of the case in Jordan, if there is any advances or not. Change, especially this kind of change, is going to be coming at a very, very slow pace and it's going to be extremely difficult, and there's going to be martyrs, and there has to be leaders, and yes, and there has to be trial and error. Uh, going out and screaming feminism may be not the effective way. Maybe there's a better way to do it. You should do it, do it, others should do it, we should all try it. Eventually, hopefully, somebody would do it and make our societies better. And sexism is not the only thing 
we have, we face. You're right, we have many different problems that, that we have to deal with, but we have to start somewhere. We are media practitioners, media educators, and journalists. We are at a privileged potential, at a privileged capacity in society where we can actually do things more than the typical average individual in society. Okay? Let's have some. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, hold on. يعني أنا بس بس الموضوع هو يعني بيعتمد على المرأة نفسها. هلا عم تسمع الترجمة تبعك بنفس الوقت. آه. لا الموضوع هو قرار للنساء بأي بلد إنه هي صارت بتحدد اليوم كل القوانين معها وهي بتقدر تحدد إنها تخوض بهذه المسؤولية وتتحملها أو لا. والدليل على هيك وانت بتحكوا انا يعني راسلت زوجتي بالبيت بعد السفره هاي الاسبوع وقلت لها احنا قاعدين بنحكي عن المسؤوليه اللي لازم تتحمليها وانت قويه ولازم تشيلي مسؤوليه الاولاد وهيك قالت لي لا تشدش كثير عن الموضوع روح بسرعه وريحني من هالموال كله يعني ف فهو قرار للنساء مش لنا يعني احنا مش احنا اللي بنمنحهم هذا It is easy to say that. It is easy to say it's in the individual's uh, it's the individual's decision. The easiest thing to, to say is uh, poor people are just bad at business or just lazy. Let's blame let's blame them for their poverty. Let's blame women for the discrimination. No, it's it's a societal thing. It's a systematic thing. And your statement that all the laws are in their favor is so further from the truth. I mean, I can just give you one law in Lebanon. You know, in Lebanon, uh, uh, a Lebanese woman cannot pass the citizenship down to her child while a man can. You, do you know that? I mean, we are, we are obsessed with that. I mean, how, how, is, this, how, how, are, how is this in favor uh, of women? We've been trying to overturn this law for, I don't, I don't remember how long, since I was a child. I mean, I think it's actually probably going to be more practical that all women have a sex change to men than to change this law. Sorry, I, that's a bad joke. Uh, somebody who didn't speak in the back. Okay, thank you. أنا يعني في سؤال بتبادر لذهني من ما لقيت في جاب صراحة من لما بلشت أدرس بالصحافة عن النوع ولا المحتوى اللي ممكن نقدمه بهاي القضية يعني أنا بس دخلت كلية الصحافة أنا كنت معادي للمرة حتى محاضرة الدكتورة ما كنت أحضرها يعني بصراحة مع إنه هذا الجو مش ما كنت أحضر شو مثلا المحاضرة اللي بتعطيني إياها دكتورة وأنت ما كنت أحضرها مع إنه هذا الجو مش موجود في البيت يعني والدي بيساعد والدتي بالأعمال المنزلية والجو بينهم صحي جدا يعني بس بعد ما اشتغلت بالمجتمع المدني بحملات ضد التحرش والاغتصاب غيرت الفكرة وشو شوي بلشت أحاول أغير في المجتمع لأنه شفت قديش زي ما تفضلت إنه القانون أبدا ما بنصف المرأة يعني خاصة في الدول العربية وقديش في عنا يعني تحفظات وقديش في حجم موروث ديني مشوه وموروث تاريخي مشوه متعلق بالعادات متعلق بالعادات والتقاليد وما غيرها السؤال يعني فعليا أنا لحد الآن مش قادر أعرف كشخص بيشتغل بالصحافة وفي مجال الإعلام شو نوع المحتوى أو حجمه ممكن نقدمه لحتى نبلش شوي شوي نحكي عن حالنا لأنه قادرين نغير مجتمعاتنا ونظرتها للأنثى ولدورها في المجتمع مع أنه يعني بنشوف قديش في رياديات وقياديات يعني بإمكانهم مش بس يغيروا العالم لا يحسنوا ويطوروا بشكل أفضل بس فعليا أنا لحد الآن مش عارف إيش نوع وحجم المحتوى ممكن نقدمه في هذه القضية شور شور let me give an answer and I'll let you give an answer actually let me get your answer first I just gave you an example of what we actually can do. We, we control the microphone, we control the media as, as men. We control the space predominantly. One of the things we can do is actually hear, have more women hear, uh, say their voice. أنا من وجهة نظري إنه في البداية توقفوا إنكم تنمطوا المرأة في المواد الإعلامية اللي بتبلشوا تنتجوها إنتوا. مثلا إنت صحفي عم تعمل قصة صحفية فيها دور للمرأة على طول بتخي بجيبوا مثلاً المرأة وهي بتشتغل بالبيت أو المرأة وهي بس عم تعمل شوبينج أو عم بتف أو عم بتنم على جارتها مع واحدة تانية طيب هذا تنميط للمرأة فصار بعقلنا إحنا يعني 
في خلفيه انه هذا هو دور المراه في المجتمع هذا اللي بتفكر فيه انه المراه بس بتحب تحكي على العالم بتحب تشتري تروح وتيجي لا هي احنا هون قاعدين زي ما انا شايفه في نساء باحثات صحفيات متعلمات مهتمين بالقراءه بالمطالعه بالسفر في كثير اشياء اهم فانا اول شيء اللي هو نبطل ننمط المراه ونظهر عنها صوره جيده من خلال يعني نبين انها دكتوره مهندسه طبيبه كثير في عندنا نساء مثل هيك في المجتمع وبعدين بس العالم بلشوا يستوعبوا هاي الفكره بنبلش بتصير عادي الامور ثانك يو اي وود اولسو انكرج يو تو تيك ا كورس ان ميديا اند جندر ميديا اند كوميونيكيشن ا فيمينست كورس اي دونت هاف ذا تايم تو كفر ذات توب تو انسر يو بيكوز ذس كود جو فور اورز ذا ثينجز ذات وي كان دو بت ذير ار تونز اوف ستاديز ذات اكشولي شو اكزامبلز اوف وات از بينج دان اند وات كان بي دان بس اي اولسو وونت تو ابلاود يو فور saying this that you were you grew up or you were when you were a child you were sexist i was too i was sexist i was racist i was sectarian i was all the isms that you can think of this is how our society raises us to be and it takes a strong character it takes an enlightened mind and it takes a lot of effort this is something you cannot unlearn it's not a switch you really have to practice it to actually internalize it and it's very difficult for all of us especially when you're like like you said you grew up who are your models your father your uncle your maybe oldest uh, brother or oldest cousin and they are all recreating the society and when you challenge it the backlash is on you right and there's all kinds of stigmas that that do that so this is i definitely applaud you for uh, saying that and for coming the whole distance from being sexist to being more enlightened but most of us if not all of us in the society and i'm not talking only about the men i'm also talking about the women are raised have learned have you drank drink it in the milk from when we were children to be sexist and racist and sectarian and all of these uh, matters and we have to unlearn it and we have to help others also un- unlearn it so with that we can go to uh, lunch right i'll go